Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think as soon as my iPad picks it up, it should be good. Better. <laughs> <laughs> How is your kitchen? All right, so good evening. Uh, we are recording, and uh, I am going to do um, a brief introduction to uh, everyone of, of the evening and of uh, Douglas Land Conservancy in general. So uh, thanks so much for signing up. If you um, were invited by somebody else to um, come this evening, uh, that person must be on our mailing list. That's how you find out about our events. So if you are interested in finding out about future events and fun things to do while we're all stuck at home, DLC is, uh, is your, your go-to source, I think, for educational, um, environmental educational programs. And so we have tonight a presentation on owls and normally mm. we, are, we are outside and we are having hot chocolate um, over in Louviers and we get a presentation from our friends at Nature's Educators uh, with some live owls and then we head out and we take a hike in search of owl activity at uh, DuPont Open Space, but not this year. So I'm happy that we were able to work up a, a workaround, I guess, for COVID. And so um, Devin Jaffe is from Nature's Educators is here, and she's going to do a half hour presentation with three live birds for us. Sanderson, who normally takes us out on our hikes and leads the way through the woods, um, we usually do it on a full moon night, not, not wouldn't be tonight anyway, but um, she is going to talk about, she's with Douglas County Open Space and going to talk about places where you might spot um, owls uh, out and about in Douglas County. And so uh, there will be time for Q&A with both of them. I just wanted to take a second to introduce myself. My name is Amy Graziano. I am Director of Outreach at Douglas Land Conservancy and happy uh, that you're all able to attend this evening. And we have uh, quite a few programs like this coming up in the next few weeks. And I wanted to give you a little um, heads up as people who are um, you know, joining us tonight, you should be in the know, right? So um, we have, Two presentations coming up with Denver Audubon, and one is going to happen on January 20th. The registration um, link will be coming out soon. It is called Wildlife in Winter, and I think it is mostly about, um, what is it called, seed eaters and bird feeders, something like that. So that'll be nice um, uh, to learn about the birds that are at your feeders and in your backyards during winter in Colorado. And then we have um, kind of a unique event coming up January. <laughs> is a gentleman who just moved to Douglas County. He lives here a year and he lives in Maine, the other part of the year. He is a retired National Park Service employee. A book about uh, 38 years of um, stories from his time with the National Park Service and fun, amusing story and the book is called um, from bear dens to the oval office and so he has a presentation that he's put together and he is going to be presenting on january 26th again over zoom and then decided that we're going to have um, a book club meeting over his book so if you want to get it and just read it great uh, there will be copies available at um, a bookstore in castle rock amazon or at the dlc office so that information soon on that and you can join us for the presentation where he talks about his book and tells us stories and shows us um, photos. Or you can join us for the book club or both, or you can just read the book. That information will be coming out soon. And then we have a third uh, or fourth, I guess, if you count tonight, event coming up February 9th called Curious Corvids, not COVID, Cu Curious Corvids. And those are birds, uh, Devin, like what? Jays, magpies, ravens, and crows. <laughs> okay, Jays. I have one right, right here. <laughs> that one, okay. So that is also at Denver Audubon. So we're looking forward to um, connecting with you virtually in the next few weeks, and then hopefully um, maybe some small group hikes uh, that we'll be planning. And then we are hoping um, second quarter, third quarter for sure. Well, not for sure, but third quarter, uh, more likely to be back in person with some events. So thanks so much. For being here tonight uh, and your interest in Douglas Land Conservancy. I hope you join the mailing list if you haven't already. 
for making a donation because that's how we um, are able to host these events and what we already have planned, that kind of thing comes from supporter donations. And we will be, um, I'll be following up uh, with this uh, link to donate if you haven't already and to watch the video from this evening. If you wanna share with friends, you're welcome to do that. And a little bit of housekeeping details for this evening. Um, there is no, all the participants or all the um, attendees I guess, um, are there's no camera for you so you're not visible at all and you have no um, way of speaking and so if you roll your mouse and the bottom bar pops up on the zoom call there is a um, something you can click on Q&A and that's how we're going to handle our questions this evening and so Devin and Jackie will be presenting and I'll kind of be facilitating if a question um, Feel free to pop your question in there as soon as it comes to mind, so you don't forget, because that's that's how it usually goes for me. Um, and then I'll either, if it's really timely, I might interrupt, but we'll probably hold all of them till till the end. So feel free to pop any questions in there, and um, and we're going to go ahead with that and get started. I think we'll be about um, about an hour, hour and fifteen minutes. So thanks so much for joining us. And I'm gonna um, turn it over to speaker view. So we just see Devin and go ahead, Devin. Thank you so much. Yay! Thanks, Amy. Um, so uh, my name is Devin. I am the founder and co-director of Nature's Educators. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're licensed by the USDA, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, United States Fish and Wildlife Service to keep non-releasable birds of prey um, and some other animals for education. Um, and this year, during the pandemic, woo, um, we also opened our wildlife hospital, so are able to do wildlife rehabilitation um, now as well. And so um, I'm here tonight to talk about owls, and as Amy said, I'd love um, questions. If you guys have any information you'd like to know, um, I'm going to leave the um, spotting owls in the wild up to Jackie. I'm going to talk more about morphology, physiology, anatomy, diet, and all that good stuff. Um, but if you guys have questions, that's what I'm here for. I'd love to help you out. Um, so um, our organization is licensed to keep non-releasable birds of prey or birds that were bred in captivity specifically for education. Um, here at Nature's Ed, we do feel that captive bred or imprinted owls um, tend to do better in educational settings. And so you will actually see three imprinted owls this evening, which are owls that have been raised um, by humans on purpose. Um, for specifically education. One, one's a little bit different. We'll talk about him here in a second, but the first two are um, captive bred at fish and wildlife facilities specifically for teaching. And so they are very comfortable with people. Um, sometimes what we see in our adult owls that are injured and then come into captivity for education, that they don't really adjust very well um, to captive life. And, and so there are a couple Things that I like to talk about with owls, a lot of people are very obsessed with owls. Um, nine times out of ten when we ask people what their favorite animal is, it's an owl, a sloth, a llama, or a goat. I don't quite understand that. So it's always very interesting to kind of hear what people say. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we see a lot of videos, especially on YouTube, about people petting owls and hugging owls and keeping them as pets. That is illegal here in the United States. You cannot have an owl as a pet. Uh, we do have special licenses. I personally hold 11 different state and federal licenses uh, to keep these raptors for uh, various jobs um, or purposes that they have here in captivity. And so many of these videos that we see are from countries that there are not permits for this. And so I always like to talk about that first with our owls now, just because that's become very popular um, since 2018. We, we see a lot of these pet owl videos. So I just always like to clear the air on that one. Um, so I have brought three different owl species to talk to you guys um, about tonight. And these are different species, three species that we can see in Douglas County. Um, and one that I'm sure all of you have seen, no matter what county you are in, they are very, very common. Um, but our first friend here actually is a screech owl. And sometimes it's kind of hard to get her to face the camera because she likes to 
stare very awkwardly at me. Um, this is an <laughs> Eastern Screech Owl. There we go. Yeah, check it out. Uh, we have both Eastern and Western Screech Owls here in Colorado. They look super, super similar. Um, the major difference is actually the beak color. Um, our Eastern Screech Owls, she would look, there we go. Um, have kind of this grayish colored beak, uh, if you will, and, and our western screech owls have a black beak. So if you're close enough or you've got good binoculars or good scope on your camera and you can see what's going on here, um, eastern screech owl, gray beak, western screech owl, black beak. They also make a completely different sound. Um, ornithologists, I'm allowed to say this because this is what my degree is in, ornithologists are not creative people. We are not art majors. <laughs> we name birds after who discovered them, where they live, the color that they are or their pattern, and the sound that they make. This one bird specifically, though, happens to be a misnomer. So we would think a screech owl would screech. It doesn't. Um, so this bird, and, and, and she's pretty quiet, so I can't get her to, to speak on command or anything like that. But if you are out and about um, at night, and I'll talk about when you see these guys, and you hear a <laughs> so like, oh gosh, yes, there's another screech owl. <laughs> That's an Eastern screech owl. Um, the Western screech owl has um, a very similar call, but if you hear them, they go <laughs> So it's, it's kind of a different sound. Um, and then they'll make a, a, a trill at the end, like a little bit different than our Eastern Screech Owl. I've heard of both of them here in Colorado. I personally still have yet to ever see a Screech Owl in the wild and I'm just very unlucky when it comes to spotting birds in the wild. I work with them every day and I never see them in the wild. That's, that's my luck. Um, so I, I want to talk about some, um, some morphology and physiology with this bird and owls in general. So this will cover all owls. Um, so a few things here. You'll notice that this bird has a very flexible neck. <laughs> she can turn her head 270 degrees. And she has the ability to do that thanks to two things. We have seven vertebrae in our neck. So, you know, we can go pretty far. We can look over our shoulders. She has 14. She has double the neck vertebrae that we have. And by having extra vertebrae, of course, it allows her to have more flexibility within her neck. The other reason that she is able to turn her head so far is because of how her veins in her neck run. Our veins are on the outside of our vertebrae. As we turn our neck, that's when we start to get kind of that pins and needles feeling. So um, if we were to, you know, set our arm on something or kind of sit a little weird, you get that pins and needles feeling because your veins are being closed off. You're not getting uh, blood supply to that part of your body. Owls' veins actually rotate with their neck. So it's almost like, um, like a PVC pipe that's, that's rotating through their vertebrae. And so she does not get that feeling. So she can turn her head 270 degrees, not get that pins and needles feeling. Um, and not feel like her head is gonna fall off. Now, she needs to be able to turn her head really far, of course, for two other major reasons. One is because like most birds, not just owls, most birds, there are some exceptions, she cannot move her eyeballs. So me, as a human, as a mammal, I can move my eyes to look right, and left. I can roll my eyes around. I can look down. I can look up. I can do all that without having to move my head. Most birds cannot do that. So if I were an owl, my eyes are stuck and fixed in my sockets. So as an owl, and I want to look over here to the right, I physically have to turn my whole head to be able to see that direction. So that's why you see these guys turning their head. Now the other reason is specific to owls and harriers. You'll notice that all owls have kind of a flat face and it looks like a satellite dish. That's called a facial disc. The feathers around their face sit right around their ears, which we'll talk about in a second. They help to catch and funnel sound into those ears. And so as she turns her head, <laughs> there's another owl that's very excited if you guys can hear. As she turns her head, she helps to catch and filter sound into those ears. So just like a satellite turning to catch signals. <laughs> Turning her head to here. This bird can hear a mouse eating 
under three feet of snow while she's sitting in the top of a cottonwood tree. That's how incredible an owl's hearing is. She doesn't need to, you need to see her prey in order to swoop down and catch it. She only has to hear it. So it's a very, very auditory um, animal. Um, and so I want to talk about the ears for just a second. She does have what are called asymmetrical ears, uneven ears. She has one ear a little higher, one ear a little lower. And we do as well. That's not just an owl thing. And you guys are all going to look in your mirrors and try to figure out which ear is higher than the other one. You do have one ear a little bit higher than the other. Most animals do. And that's what helps us to um, triangulate or pinpoint where sound is coming from. Owls are just very, very extreme because they are using their ears more than their eyes for hunting. tape. She has one ear, the, the left ear is lower and the right ear is higher. So I remember left low, right high. So this ear is lower and is typically listening to things below and behind her. The right ear is higher and more forward. So is listening to things above and in front of her. So by having those super asymmetrical ears, sometimes you'll see owls kind of doing this weird kind of dance movement and they're listening and pinpointing where a sound is coming from. So you'll see them kind of doing this little dance out in the wild and then they'll freeze. And when they freeze, that means that they have pinpointed exactly where that sound is coming from. They can swoop down and catch their prey. Super, super cool. Now, um, screech owls uh, are pretty tiny, so I'm holding her pretty close to the screen. If I were to bring her back toward my body, now you can see that she's actually pretty tiny. <laughs> so um, this bird is a little overweight. We're not judging her. It's after the holidays. Okay, it's been Thanksgiving, it's been Christmas, and now New Year's, so please don't judge this bird. Um, normally, they weigh about 150 grams, um, which is about six dry erase markers. So if you can think about how much a dry erase marker weighs, it's about six of those put together. So not very much. And we'll talk about why here in a second. This bird weighs 246 grams today. So she is going on her holiday diet. It's her New Year's resolution. But like I said, we're not judging. So sorry, friend. She's not really, what? A diet? Now, speaking of diet, these birds, for the most part, are eating small mammals. Mice, voles, moles, small rats, bats. Screech owls are very, very good at catching bats right out of the sky. This is a nocturnal species, and that's another reason that's kind of hard to see screech owls out in the wild. They have excellent camouflage. This is called cryptic camouflage, like a puzzle. Um, so you can imagine this bird sitting in a cottonwood tree. It'd be very difficult to see her with this um, bark-like appearance or cryptic appearance, if you will. They sit very, very still when they're sleeping during the day. Of course, their eyelids are shut and her eyelids also are camouflaged. You don't need any more food. So we are definitely not eating. She likes mealworms and I usually hide mealworms in my glove and we're not doing that tonight because she is kind of chunky. So um, when she's sitting in a tree, she'll shut her eyes. She's got great camouflage even on her eyelids. She sits perfectly still and doesn't make the sound. She is a nocturnal species, so it can be kind of difficult to find these guys um, in the wild. And Jackie might get a little more into how we spot owls um, in the wild in a, in a little bit here. Um, now, this bird's name is Thistle. Thistle is one year old. She is full size. She will not get any bigger than this. Screech owls are full size at six weeks, so they grow up very, very quickly. Um, the raptor world is, is difficult out in the wild. And so these guys have to hurry up, grow up, be full size, move out of the nest, go out, find their own territory, be able to hunt their own prey and, and find their own mate. I mean, these birds for the most part, like most birds, um, are breeding in the springtime. So March, April, May is when we're gonna see screech owls starting to pair up and, and um, hang out. Now, there is only one owl species in all of Colorado that builds a nest. And that is the Mexican spotted owl, which is highly, highly endangered here in Colorado. Um, we actually have them down here um, in Canyon City, uh, where I am currently presenting from. So we do have them here because we have old growth forests, and that is where those birds need to exist. All of our other owls will use a nest that is built by another animal, um, like the burrowing owl. We use a, uh, an abandoned prairie dog hole or a burrow. Um, our screech owls will use a woodpecker hole or an old squirrel nest, a magpie nest. Great horned owls will use a bald eagle nest, a red-tailed hawk's nest, or a crow's nest. 
So our owls are a little bit lazy um, and will use something else unless you are a spotted owl and you build your own stick nest. Um, these guys also, um, with their diet, um, can eat things other than mammals. So once in a while, we will see them hunting other small birds. We will see them hunting insects, reptiles, and amphibians. So this is considered an opportunistic predator, which means when the opportunity presents itself and she thinks they could probably catch that, they're going to try to catch it. Um, so that's all I've got for the screech owl. I'm going to save some other anatomy here for another friend. Um, so give me just a second. I'm going to put this bird away and get on another bird, and I will be right back. Okay, so the screech owl um, is called a strigidae or common owl. So that is a, an owl with a rounded facial disc. So you notice that satellite face is, is a nice circle. Um, a smooth sternum and smooth toes. The next bird that we're meeting is a titanidae owl. That is a barn owl. Hi. Now the barn owl is the most common owl on earth. They live on every continent except Antarctica and they just look a little bit different depending on where they live in the world. So this is our common barn owl. So this is what we would see here in Colorado. Um, typically males are more white underneath. The females will have more um, speckling or spotting but it really depends on the individual bird. This bird is a male and is very, very pale in coloration and also has a very rounded face. Typically the barn owls that we see here, he's like spotted himself in the camera. Um, typically the barn owls that we see here in North America will have more of a long face. This bird um, looks very much like a European barn owl, um, which tends to have more of a circular face. Now, Titanidae owls have a heart shaped facial disc, and so you'll see that when he turns his face around uh, with very heavy crines. And crines are the whisker-like feathers that stick up off of most birds' beaks. And owls will use those crines to be able to find their food. Owls are very far-sighted. So when he goes out and he catches that mouse, he sees it from very, very far away, a football field distance away. He can see that mouse totally clearly. He swoops down, catches it, he's got it in his feet. Now he can't see it very well, it's very blurry. So he needs to use those crines or those whiskers, um, which of course are not hair, they're feathers. Um, he uses those crines, those whiskers to feel his food, get it arranged in the way that he needs to be able to eat it. And then he'll usually swallow it either in big chunks or whole if it's something small like a mouse or a bull. Titanidae owls like the barn owl also have a notch in their sternum. So they don't have a smooth sternum like most birds do. Nobody knows why Titanidae owls have a notched sternum. Still a super mystery in the, in the bird world. Also, on their middle, I know it's very exciting, on their middle talon, instead of being smooth like strigidae or common owls, their middle, middle talon has little notches on it that make it look like a hairbrush, like a comb. That is used to comb their facial disc. The Titanidae owl's feathers around their face are super stiff. Strigidae owls are very soft. So he needs to be able to take that talon and comb that facial disc or preen those feathers to make sure that they are in order so that he can still filter in that sound. So that's what differentiates our Titanidae owls from Strigidae or common, common owls. And we do have the only Titanidae owl that we have here in North America is the barn owl. And when we get into other continents, we have bay, masked, sooty, and grass owls, which are all Titanidae owls. 
all look super similar to our barn owl. And this bird's name is Caliban. He is um, like Shakespeare. Um, he is three years old. He, like the screech owl, was hatched and raised in captivity specifically for education. And so um, it's kind of hard to see in our screech owl. She's really fluffy. Um, but our barn owl here, you might notice that this bird's got a little gold band. He's got very ticklish feet, so I can't touch him. Um, a little gold band on his leg there that has Fish and Wildlife Service numbers. Um, you guys can probably guess what that one is. <laughs> um, and those numbers are registered almost like a, like a, uh, a microchip or a collar on a dog um, to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service so that if this bird um, were ever lost or were to get away and, and, and have a problem, we know that this bird belongs to us. <laughs> I don't know how well you guys can hear this. <laughs> So owls make a huge variety of sounds. Um, many times we have this idea that owls hoot. That is something out of Hollywood. I'm so sorry to be the bubble burster. There is only one owl in all of North America that hoots. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. The barn owl should have been called the screech owl. This bird's actual call is terrifying. It sounds like fingernails being dragged down a chalkboard is a really awful, terrible sound. But he can also make purring sounds. He can make little squeaking sounds, which is what he's making now, which is a, I'm really excited kind of little sound like, oh, do you have food for me? You already ate though. We can't have 18 meals a day. But um, if you guys can hear that sound, that's a really excited sound. You might hear um, juveniles or nestlings making that sound to their parents because it's a food begging call. So he's like, oh, please feed me, please feed me. And because this bird, like the screech owl, is a human imprint, he doesn't understand that he is a barn owl. He should act like a barn owl, or how we perceive a barn owl is acting. This bird is a human. So he's very comfortable going out in front of people because he is a person, or we're all barn owls. Mirrors do not work in the raptor world. So he doesn't understand, even if he looks in a mirror, that, hey, you know what? That's me. He doesn't understand that. Now this bird has different coloration than our screech owl. So our screech owl had cryptic coloration, which is camouflage like a tree. This bird has what's called bi camouflage or counter shading. In counter shading or bi camouflage, bi like a bicycle of course means two. So he's two completely different sets of camouflage depending on where he is. This light coloration on his underside helps to break up his outline while he's flying in the sky. So when something like a mouse or a rat or even a small rabbit is looking up in the sky, it's harder for them to make out that this is a bird. This dark coloration on his back helps him to blend into the dirt, grass, trees, and we'll face it, the barn rafters uh, where this bird would be hanging out. So counter shading, two completely different sets of Camouflage. You guys might hear, I've got a chicken that's in here that um, broke her talon and so has band-aids on and now has just figured out that there's an owl um, next to her. So you guys might hear the chicken going off now. That's all. We have a lot of birds going on here. Um, so these guys also, you'll notice too, that their eyes are a dark coloration. Now the eyes are not black. They're actually very, very dark brown where our screech owl have those very yellow um, or bright colored irises. Typically, you know, this is not always the case, but typically owls that have dark colored eyes are strictly nocturnal. Owls that have yellow eyes usually are crepuscular. That's twilight, dawn, and dusk. Owls that have orange, red, or um, a lighter color eye usually are diurnal. That is not always the case. And a, and a good example of that not being the case would be the saw-wet owl, little tiny owl that we have right, right there in Douglas County. Um, those guys have yellow eyes and are strictly nocturnal. Now, we can see barn owls out and flying during the daytime. We can see barn owls at dawn and dusk. We can see barn owls at night. Again, this is a very opportunistic predator so he will be out hunting when he's hungry. Just like if we're in the middle of the night, we get up and need to go to the fridge because we need a midnight snack. Same for these guys. But on average, the barn owl tends to be a nocturnal predator. So I'm gonna take him back. I'm gonna grab out one more bird here for you guys to see. So give me just a second.
All right, this next friend has been very anxiously awaiting his turn. This is the one that's been making all the noise in the background, if you guys could hear that. This is the largest species of native owl that we have here in Colorado. And I say native because once in a while we do get the snowy owl. People freak out when we see snowy owls here in Colorado. It's normal. <laughs> I hate to be the bubble burster, but we do get snowy owls here every year. It's okay, but they are not considered a native species. They're a visitor. Um, so this guy actually uh, is the largest native species here in Colorado. This is the third largest species of owl um, here in North America. And he's now not going to look at the camera naturally. Owls and their flexible necks make it very difficult for a virtual programs sometimes. So this is Achilles, and Achilles hey, is a great horned owl. And so you'll see, again, no creativity in the bird world. This is a large owl that appears to have horns. So we call it a great horned owl. These guys are big. However, I have heard people over and over and over, I saw this owl. It was like three feet tall and had a six foot wingspan. That's an eagle, okay? <laughs> that is a huge, huge bird. This is as big as great horned owls get. And this bird, actually, this specific bird is gigantic. Typically, with most raptor species, the female is up to two thirds larger than the male. This bird is the size of a female. He weighs four and a half pounds. He has about a four and a half foot wingspan. This is a female size. This bird's been blood DNA sexed twice. He's a male, so he's just a really, really big male. Now, usually the great horned owls that we see here in Colorado are more of a gray coloration. Again, depending on where you see them here in the United States, they'll be a different color. They don't change color, it just depends on where they originate. Typically, very, very north, all the way into Alaska, they're almost solid black. They are very, very dark. You think that they'd be white? That's the opposite direction. Usually when we see them east, they'll be this color, more of a reddish kind of rusty coloration. We see them west, they're more gray. So this bird's a little bit darker, more rusty color than the great horned owls that we would normally see here in the wild in Colorado. Um, so this bird has a little bit of a different story. He is a human imprint. He was raised in captivity. He was raised in captivity illegally. It is illegal to take in wildlife and take care of them without proper licensing. Somebody stole this bird out of his nest and thought it would be really cool to keep an owl as a pet. That is a federal offense. You cannot keep these guys as a pet and it almost always ends poorly for the animal. So somebody took him, brought him into their home, and raised him as a pet, feeding him hamburger and cat food. Also two things that raptors should never be eating. So luckily they realized that maybe they bit off a little bit more than they could chew. Um, he was relinquished to the Oklahoma uh, Game and Parks Commission where he was sent to a licensed wildlife rehabilitator in hopes that she could rehabilitate him and release him back to the wild, which of course is always the goal. Unfortunately, it didn't work. And you might notice that once in a while he'll make kind of a kind of sound. That is a baby great horned owl's begging call. This bird is four years old. He should not be making that sound anymore. Um, so that sound. <laughs> so he associates humans with food. So if I were to release this bird to the wild, he would have absolutely no idea how to survive without human intervention. So he was transferred to a licensed falconer, someone that is permitted to hunt with um, birds of prey um, in Oklahoma. And he got him to fly, but this bird would never fly to his glove. He'd always fly to his shoes, which is very strange. That individual called me and said, I need help with this owl. Um, would you be willing to take him and train him? And I took him three years ago um, and got him trained to fly to the glove. Um, that other falconer said, you know what? He loves you. Just keep him. I love this bird. <laughs> he loves me. He does great. Now he is on my falconry license and is actually out hunting rabbits um, and pheasants and quail for me. So he is a successful hunter. Um, but in a way that he relies on me to help him find that game. 
Now, a couple other um, biological things I'd like to talk with, about with these owls. Um, you notice on the screech owl and now the great horned owl, they have these tufts of feathers on their head, and that's where we get that um, saying horned owl. They kind of look like a cat, like they've got cat ears. Those are called plumicorns, one of my favorite words. And those plumicorns, no one knows exactly what they are for, but we have a theory that they help with three different things. Camouflage, so breaking up the bird's outline, helping them to communicate to other birds of the same species, and to help them catch and filter even more sound into those ears. Sometimes when we look at an owl, we think that their beak is very tiny. This bird has a huge beak. Those crines, those whisker feathers that we talked about earlier, hang over owl's beaks. This bird's beak is this big. It's, it's huge and very, very powerful because he needs to be able to use it to crush bones. And speaking of crushing bones, he also has gigantic feet. Great horned owls can squeeze 500 pounds of pressure per square inch in their feet. So very, very, very powerful. And owls also have what are called zygodactyl toe structures, zygodactyl feet. Two toes in front, two toes in back. But like the osprey, which is a fishing raptor, they can rotate this outer toe to then have three toes in front and one toe in back. So they have the ability to do that to help them grip onto prey like a cage and to help them grip onto the perch um, that they would be sitting on because five pounds, that seems like a lot. It's really not that much um, in the bird world. So he's really got to hold on. He has hollow bones. He's going to eat the chicken now. Okay, we're not having chicken. He has hollow bones. He goes to the bathroom a lot and feathers are very, very light. So those three things help these guys to be very light. Now, a couple other things real quick here. He is the only owl in North America that says hoot. So if you hear, this is the only species that makes that sound. Any other sound? Not a great horned owl. Now, great horned owls have a huge vocabulary. They can make screeches, they can make screams, they can purr, they can whistle. But if you hear that iconic hoot, 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 this is the bird that does it. The only bird that comes close is the long-eared owl who kind of sounds like a frog or a toad. Like, woo, 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 woo. Um, and then we have our barred owl, which is a woo, woo, woo. who cooks for you? So this is the iconic hoot, hoot, hoot that we hear on all the recordings, TV shows, cartoons, movies, all that. Now, also really quick, we've got huge eyeballs. That's the major thing that we see when we look at an owl, especially a great horned owl. His eyes are gigantic. They are, we're not having chicken. They are so big that they touch each other. They touch the back of the inside of his skull. And owl's eyes are not round like our eyes are. They're more of a light bulb or an ice cream cone shape. And by having that shape and size allows them to have lots of extra rod cells. Rod cells are what pick up light. Cone cells pick up color. He doesn't have very many cone cells. So as far as we know, I will see in grayscale. They see in black and white. It's like a couple primary colors, a little bit of red and a little bit of blue. That's it. That's okay because he's relying more on his ears for hunting than he is his eyes or his vision. That being said, many of us hear that owls are very wise. Oh, owls are so smart. They're so wise. If his eyes are so big that they touch each other and touch the back of the inside of his skull, not a lot of room for a brain, is there? In, sorry for that. In comparison to our other raptors, owls have incredibly tiny brains. He is what we call a primitive instinctual predator, meaning that he is relying on instincts and adaptations in order to find, catch, and kill his prey. The only reason that we call owls wise is actually thanks to ancient Greek mythology. Athena is the Greek goddess of wisdom. All the major Greek gods and goddesses have an animal companion or symbol. Athena just happens to be an owl. 
So over time, people have associated owls with wisdom. So in reality, not a lot going on in there. So save yourselves the embarrassment when you go up to a bird handler and say, oh, an owl, they're so wise. That's my spirit animal. We all laugh on the inside when people say that. So save yourself the embarrassment. I'm going to put him back um, and give you guys a couple minutes to think of questions here, and I'll be right back. Okay, cool. So Amy, if we want to do um, Q&A time really quick, I'm sorry, I went a couple minutes over. Uh, we can do that. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right, so I'm going to read you the questions that were asked um, and let you just not worry about the tech stuff and just answer. Uh, okay. You mentioned something about um, not very many owls hooting in the world. So the question is, what other owls hoot? So here in the United States, it's only the great horned owl. Super easy. So if you hear the hoo, 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 that's the only species that makes that sound. So that one's very, very easy to identify. There's some owls that come close. Like I said, the long-eared owl um, kind of sounds similar, but it sounds more like a, a really upset frog or toad. Like <laughs> um, the Eurasian eagle owl and the Blackenstein's fishing owl in Russia and Europe um, mm -hmm. will also hoot. But here in the United States, it's only the great horned owl. Okay. Um, you had mentioned people freak out over snowy owls. Why, why do they freak out? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, and I'm, I'm saying this in the nicest way possible. Please don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm saying this in a very nice way. People that have the birding life lists and photographers yeah. get very excited to see a snowy owl. We have snowy owls here in Colorado every year. This is not anything new. And, and so what we see, these people are like, whoa, a snowy owl. And then the issue that we see is these, these individuals who are very excited, and, and not everybody is this way, again, um, they get very excited. And if they get too close to those birds, they do what's called bumping. They bump those birds. Just last year, there was a snowy owl um, that, that some photographers got a little too close to, bumped the bird right into the highway. The bird got hit by a car. Ah. Um, so that sucks. Um, so when we are talking about birds, especially these birds that are rare to find, like the snowy owl, again, we have them every year. They're just difficult to find. And so that's why people get so excited. I've never seen a snowy owl. The, I've never seen a snowy owl in the wild. Um, so I'd love to see one. However, we have to remember that we also need to stay really, really far away from them. Um, snowy owls don't tend to exist in cities like the great horned owls do um, and aren't as used to people. And so we don't want to 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 make them upset but yeah people freak out about the snowy owl every year it's always cracks us up excited um okay there's another question i'm not sure which owl you had when the question was asked so maybe just answer it for all of them can you tell us about their wingspan wingspan screech owl you now 14 inches barn owl three feet great horned owl four and a half feet okay um, a, um, a, a nice comment for you. You're awesome. I love your sense of humor with the, um, with the birds. And then, Thanks. Uh, <laughs> are the owls trained? And I don't know, trained for, for what, but just trained. Well, you had said that the one was trained to come with your glove and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and so I like to expand on that because a lot of times when people think of trained, they think of parrots, like, the bird's going to do a trick. <laughs> for us to work with these birds, for me to get an owl to sit on this glove and not freak out, that is training. So yes, these birds are all trained. You just saw them on the screen sitting here in front of you where I can't just go out. I mean, it'd be cool. Like Dr. Do a little like, come on down owl. You guys are going to sit with me. Woo! Um, I can't do that. So it, it does take a little bit um, to be able to get them um, trained to do that. Now, all three owls that you saw are all also flight trained, which means that um, they will fly for demonstrations. The screech owl is what we call target trained. Um, and so we'll see a specific target that we have trained her to fly to, and she will fly to that target over and over and over. And then she gets a mealworm for her treat because that's her favorite little snack. Um, our barn owl 
is trained to fly to a target and to train uh, to fly to a glove um, on a whistle. The great horned owl is, is not actually an education bird. He's my hunting bird. He's my licensed falconry bird. So that bird is trained to go out and hunt um, with me as a partner. So I like to talk about that training because yes, these birds are all trained just for all different things. So that's a good question. Okay, I'm gonna do um, one more question and then let's turn it over to Jackie. And there are two more questions actually. The second one is something that Jackie's gonna address anyway. And so the last one is, I'm having trouble reading this weird font or something. Um, can you see snowy owls flying? in the streets, I think it says. Can you, where, where, I mean, and then someone else told you uh, that if you want to see one in the wild, head to the Dakotas during the winter, but. Yes. Yes, okay, so if anyone wants to see them, um, and does Go north. Want, go north, okay. And then when they do come through <clears throat> Colorado, uh, maybe tell just a little bit about where, like obviously they're migrating, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And where do people see them generally? Typically, DIA. Okay. That's where we All see right. them. Thank you. And what time of year is that? Like, so it's random because we've actually seen them throughout um, different times of the year. Um, but usually, fall and, and, and winter, of course, is okay. when we we'll see these guys. So, okay. Yeah. September, October, uh, November, December. Yeah. Devin, uh, thank you so much. And do you want to do any kind of a closing? Um, comments on nature's educators before we turn it over to Jackie? Yeah, sure. So um, I appreciate you guys all coming to listen to me talk about owls forever. I could talk all night, so I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, but again, nature's educators is a 501c3. We are a nonprofit organization. We are actually the largest wildlife program um, in the state of Colorado. We visit all the states surrounding us as well. And um, if you guys would like to support us, we do have our um, Facebook page. We have our website, which is natureseducators.org. Any donations that you send us um, go back directly to care for our educational animals um, or our rehab patients. So all of that helps, especially this two years now, <laughs> I'm saying, um, of, of the pandemic where we cannot go into schools, we can't go to libraries. Um, we can't go to festival festivals and events and things like that. And so um, we lost close to 50,000 in program income this year that we're trying to make up um, in donations. So everything helps. So appreciate it. But thank you guys for listening to me. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. So, um, all right, we're going to turn it over to, um, to Jackie. Jackie, you want to step in and introduce yourself? Hey. And okay, sure. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself, and then I'm gonna share the screen. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, it's really great to have so many people in the audience. I wish I could see you, and um, uh, I really enjoy this opportunity to actually partially socialize with somebody because um, I've been kind of bound up at home, and I go into the office, and nobody else is there. So um, Douglas County Open Space, I've worked with Douglas County Open Space now for 18 years, and um, I've really enjoyed seeing all the changes um, that we've um, increased our properties. Um, Douglas County Open Space is, um, is funded by a sales tax, and I'm the natural resource specialist with Douglas County Open Space, so every time we get a new property or I go to one of our older properties. I'm always seeing wonderful um, wildlife and um, including, including the birds. And birders get really excited too when they do see one of the owl species. So we're going to try to um, show you some of the places where you could see owls. Um, you know, it's usually just circumstance that you happen into a, to an owl, but a lot of times if you look in the right places, um, you'll have, you'll increase that opportunity to see certain type, types of owls. Uh, let's see, oh, conservation. Um, conservation plays a big part in what I'm gonna be talking about too. So we're going to, there we go, here's some owls. And um, we're just gonna concentrate on owls that you would likely see in Douglas County. I know we're not um, including everything here. We don't have the, the screech owl, whether it's Western or Eastern. Um, 
screech owl in the picture, but um, remember that those can be found here too. And then your occasional um, other owls like the snowy owl. I've, I have seen snowy owls. Um, actually, it was just in El Paso County, just over the border. So they, they do come through occasionally. And um, so we want to go over, you know, what you might see and where you might see them on open space properties. And also remember in your neighborhoods, um, birds can fly, owls can fly. Um, they aren't just on open space properties. They're not just um, in parks. Uh, they're in neighborhoods and um, they've adapted. A lot of them have adapted to the neighborhoods, especially um, with the great horned owl, uh, as Devin was talking about. And, um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about some others that um, have adapted to um, the human way of life um, and what the humans can provide um, just by circumstance. And um, it's, they've, humans have created habitats, but we also really want to preserve those, those wild habitats too. Okay, so Amy, go ahead. Okay, this is um, a map of Douglas County. And if you notice the green on the left is all national forest. So a good portion of Douglas County is, is um, the national forest and um, provides especially a lot of wooded habitat. Um, we've had some major fires in um, our forest and that um, is changing the habitats. Hopefully, bit by bit, those um, those um, fire areas are coming back, and um, and it's providing places for certain owls to be able to hunt um, once um, once it starts getting a little darker or early in the morning. Um, they'll go into those open areas and um, and be able to find prey. So um, when Douglas County uh, purchases properties or some of the properties were given. We're lucky to get, say, like DuPont open space, which is up at the um, at the top left. And um, I don't re really have the pointer here, but if you look up in the upper left-hand side where it has um, the brown properties, those are the properties that Douglas County actually owns. And the the darker green properties, those are state parks. So we try to purchase properties that are adjacent to other preserved lands. And um, so in the upper left-hand side, you're pretty much in the Plum Creek watershed. You are in the Plum Creek watershed all along the western side. And that water then flows into the South Platte River. And along the creeks and the rivers, um, where those properties are, you will find um, usually cottonwoods, you'll find those riparian zones, and that's where um, you might see the great horned owls and other, other birds that need the nesting cavities too. Cottonwoods provide really good nesting cavities. Um, they provide big trees that can support some of those bigger nests. So um, we have the DuPont open space um, and we will look at the great horned owl in one of our other slides. Um, this is, to me, this is one of the birdiest properties that we have um, right up there. And it's um, just on the out, it's, it surrounds the town of, the village of Louviers, and it's just off Santa Fe. If we go um, in towards the National Forest a little bit more to the left, then we'll get to our um, Sharp Tail Ridge open space, um, which um, could have uh, possibly, I know the road that goes um, to that property um, does have the burrowing owls um, alongside it. Right now, Sharp Tail, um, since we've had the property, it hasn't had any prairie, oh, it does have prairie dogs just on the outside edge. Um, closer to Roxborough State Park. So between that property and Roxborough, there are um, prairie dogs in there. So um, we'll talk about um, a little bit more about the burrowing owls liking that habitat in there. Um, and then the state park, Roxborough State Park, um, is, 
is loaded with various birds. And I have seen um, the sawwet owl right there, just walking along the trail. It was just sitting on a branch, um, and it was a, it was um, an oak, a gamble oak branch. Um, okay, so let's let's go down. Oh, and then we have the Nelson um, open space too, right there, and you have to walk quite a ways to get to it, but um, it's a beautiful property and um, very very primitive back there. So you'll see wildlife that is not disturbed too much by humans. Gets very, very low um, usage as far as um, hikers and mountain bikers. Okay, then if we go, let's see. Um, we have some new, pro a new property that's just right there. And that's the Schmidt. I think we're at the Schmidt property. And um, that um, is about 500 and some acres. And maybe we'll, um, we'll provide a special hike um, this next summer um, to go, we'll be bushwhacking, but um, we'll, we'll try to go and see that property and um, induce it, start some bird counts in there um, just to um, see what they have, bird surveys, I should say bird surveys, okay? And then going south a little bit, uh, we have the um, Dawson Butte. Um, Dawson Butte um, is pretty much a carnivorous um, forest property. And so you could have a wide variety of, of owls in that, in that property too. And going down a little bit farther south, Sandstone Ranch, we've, we've had some wonderful birders in the last three years. Um, providing us um, with um, evening um, hikes, owl hikes that they've taken, a lot of them just very, very small with um, some of the ornithologists and, and really good birders who are, we're just coming up with a list to see what we have there. Great horned owls, definitely I've seen there. And um, I believe software owls have been seen there too. And we have a few more. Okay, um, we'll go just go quickly on this. You want to see more birds than maps. And th this is the Greenland mm -hmm. area, Greenland, Spruce Mountain. And we'll be talking about those a little bit later. We have fields, a lot of fields there, as well as a conifer coniferous, coniferous forest, not carnivorous. <laughs> and then going up, okay, then we'll jump over to Cherry Creek. We're in the Cherry Creek watershed as you go to the right. And there's Lincoln Mountain just sitting there and um, a real varied habitat from the riparian um, to the really cool rocks and, and conifer coniferous forests. And then as we go a little bit north, um, there's Prairie Canyon Ranch um, right there, and it's adjacent to Cascwood Canyon State Park. Um, definitely, I've seen, I think all of the owls that we're gonna talk about, I've seen at Prairie Canyon, even, um, even the burrowing owls um, oh. I saw there. There was an abandoned, um, uh, abandoned prairie dog town, a very small one that was abandoned, and they were there too. Okay, and then just heading up north um, a little bit, we're we're on the plains here, so um, you do see more of the burrowing owls in the fields, and um, but we've we've also found even the long-eared owls at um, at the Hidden Mesa property, and that's Hidden Mesa. All of that should be brown. Some of it shows gray, but all of that should be brown. And then we have the um, Bayou Gulch um, property, and, um, and that's right next to another property that, that we recently got. It's called Two Bridges, and if you haven't hiked that, go ahead and do that. Um, there are prairie dog, there is a, a small prairie dog presence there, and um, if they're not there, you might find the burrowing owls coming in there too. And then we have um, Hungry Horse, which is right along the Cherry Creek Trail. So these are all um, places other than Prairie Canyon Ranch needs special um, admission there. And our new property, the Schmidt property needs um, special arrangements to get in there too. Okay, then going along to, let's go to our next slide. We can jump to it. There we go. Um, the burrowing owls. Um, Hidden Mesa. 
Um, we probably have more prairie dogs there than any other property that we have. And the um, burrowing owls come along with that. Just like, you know, if you have um, an open prairie, you're going to find a lot of the lot of the animals live underground. So um, just expect that's where you'd find the burrowing owls. We do have a couple of um, perches that were per that were put in by um, Eagle Scouts several years ago, and those perches are um, for for raptors to sit on um, to hunt and um, and just kind of keep the prairie dog population in check. So we have provided some um, additional habitat um, features for these for these um, predators um, that are that are the birds. Um, also, they are they also like grasshoppers. So a lot of these prairie lands um, are very attractive to attractive to these burrowing owls. Um, they don't have the tufts, um, the ear tufts like um, a lot of the other owls would have, and just kind of rounded heads, just so that they can get down into those burrows well. So um, Hidden Mesa Open Space um, has a lot of miles of trails, so go check that one out. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. And the barn owls. Um, uh, this picture is actually at um, Sandstone Ranch. And barn owls, yes, um, they've, they've been around a lot longer than barns have been around. And traditionally, they would be in like little caves, say like little um, sheltered caves in the back background there that would have been attractive to barn owls. Um, they like dark places. Um, I knew I know when I grew up we had barn owls up in our barn and we had a little window at the top of the barn kind of real similar to this barn that you're seeing here just a little bit bigger and that window was always open in the summertime and and the barn owls could um, could fly in and and roost in there and they probably they probably had some nests in there too and um, again they like uh, mammals and going for the small mammals. One thing um, that you need to keep in mind is any rat poison, mouse poison too, is really going to affect um, any of the owls who do eat, do eat these mammals if they get into that poison. Um, so if it's secondhand um, poison, uh, they, can, um, they can feel the effects from, from that, that um, poison that you put out to, you know, keep the, keep your rodent population down, um, it can still affect some of these, some of these owls. Um, we have guided hikes at Sandstone Ranch, so, um, you know, it's possible that we, we will occasionally see um, some of the owls there, and it could be the barn owls. I know the previous owners saw them there quite a bit. Okay, next. Okay, the sawwed owl. Um, this is an owl that um, I see um, probably more than any of the other little owls. Um, during the daytime, it can just be still on a branch. It likes a lot of cover. So if you go into a conifer forest, you're, you're apt, to, you're not so much apt to see them, but you might be lucky enough to encounter them. Um, I have a picture of the tree cutting. We have at, at Spruce Mountain, we have a tree cutting event there every year except for this year. Um, I think I started the first one about 15 years ago. Um, but you might remember at Rockefeller Center when they got their Christmas tree in, uh, they discovered when they took their wrapping off that there was a saw wet owl in there. And um, they like to be burrowed in there, but I think the saw wet owl was in there a little bit too long. They had to rehab it a little bit before they released it back. But um, they're in very heavily covered areas, especially during the daytime when they're trying to sleep. And, um, and then also they can nest over here at the bottom left, um, nest in the nesting cavities that, that they have at, we have at Spruce Mountain. And um, also they can use, um, in the upper left hand corner you can see the flicker box um, at Highlands Ranch. So the flicker box um, is a good size. 
um, for them. Uh, flickers can make their own homes, so we really don't need to create boxes for flickers, but this might be more for um, kestrels. So like a kestrel size opening um, would also be attractive to, um, to the sawquat owl. Okay, we can go next. And of course, the great horned owl. And one of the properties where I see great horned owls often, and I think I've seen great horned owls at many of our properties, but this one has really nice habitat for them. It has um, the big, strong cottonwood trees that can support the larger nests that were made by hawks. So we have a lot of hawks that nest um, on this um, property, the DuPont property. And if you're looking for owls, you know, take a look under, if you have a, a great branch that's hanging over, it's wide open, it's big enough for the owls to get their wings in there and fly in there and perch and, and just wait and listen for those little mammals or lizards or whatever's rustling around at night, rustling around at night. Um, while they're waiting, they might drop some of their, um, their owl pellets, which are the part of the, of the previous um, prey animal that they couldn't digest. So they, they just throw up this ball of, regurgitate, I guess you should say, regurgitate this <laughs> ball of, of bones and hair. And, um, and you'll find that under their perch site. So go around and look under these wonderful branches and maybe under a power pole if you're in an urban area or if you're in a rural area with a great power pole, um, you might find evidence that they've been there. You might also find their whitewash. So a lot of times when I'm hiking, I'm sometimes looking down and I'll just see a bunch of whitewash um, on some, a bunch of leaves. But if I look up, I'll see Yep, there's a nice, um, nice place for the owls to perch. So um, connect that and then come back another time and you might see them up there. Um, the other thing that the great horned owls love in this kind of habitat, this is riparian habitat with the cottonwoods, is um, a place to hunker down in during the daytime when they'd like to sleep. But if you want to um, see owls sometimes you just have to listen to the other birds if there's a real commotion going on um, there could be there could be other birds that are harassing a sleeping owl um, i know at prairie canyon ranch i think this a year ago i was out there and there was a i behind a rock i saw a bunch of ravens just jumping up and jumping up behind this rock and i kept seeing their heads and their wings and everything and we went um, a little bit closer, and I think Kat, I don't know if Kathy's with us tonight, but um, one of our wonderful volunteers, great person, Kathy, um, went, we went around, looked at behind the rock, and there was a, there was a um, great horned owl that they were um, harassing, and the poor guy was being picked on, and um, it ended up flying away, but I think the ravens went ahead and followed him. So um, keep your ears open, keep your eyes open, um, look for things, look for signs of these birds too, look for feathers. And um, you know, the owl feathers, very, um, uh, very, very feathery, very soft, very quiet. Um, and you know, it'll give you an indication that those birds have been there. And let's see, go ahead. Um, yeah. Oh, I want, also wanted to give credit. I think I had some of the names on some of these um, photos. Uh, Kurt Frankenfeld did this one. This is a great, this is a great horned owl, even though you see those red eyes. He took a picture of it, of course, at night and it made a great Halloween picture. But, um, uh, you know, looking at for owls can be great for photographers. As Devin was mentioning, a lot of photographers go out um, looking for them. But usually it's just by, by chance that you do run across them and enjoy them while they're out there. And, um, and I think Devin already, I was going to do some, some of the calls of some of the birds, but I think Devin covered them pretty well, unless anybody wants to hear again any of the specific birds 
um, I could I could run that through too. But you can get an app for your phone um, so that you can learn the different calls of the various various owls as well as other kinds of birds, and um, and then look for some great um, great books too um, to learn a little bit more about the behaviors. Um, there's a Sibley's book that um, has, you know, Sibley's guides probably, oops, am I turning this the wrong way? Okay, Sibley's guide um, we got for it. behaviors. Maybe I should hold this back. Yeah, I'm trying That's to better. put it closer so you can see it better. No, I have to put it back so you can see it better. And, um, and look, for, look for some of the apps that you can put on your phone. They come in really handy. Um, for bird identification and but but some of these books have been written you know offer a lot more information oh another one I was going to show you this one the breeding bird atlas um, for Colorado this <laughs> this is really really big but it will tell you specifically um, these are some of the best studies that have been done and put into this book um, this is the second atlas that has come out that I've known of and and it just is chock full of really good information about the Colorado birds and um, including these owls. So um, those are two books I'd really, really recommend that are out there besides the apps. So um, okay, any other questions? questions? Anything, yeah, things that we didn't ones. cover that we should have covered? <laughs> so yeah, there are some really good questions. Um, do that the the map that you shared uh where can uh -huh. where can everyone find that well right now the best one would be to go to the interactive map on the douglas county website so if you go to the douglas county website um, and go to dc outdoors and look for the interactive map and with that it will show you all kinds of public properties that um, are are in Douglas County. So not only Doug, not only are Douglas County open space properties, but it will also include um, different parks, parks that are in Highlands Ranch and Parker and so forth. Um, that that map will probably be replaced fairly soon. They say our technology technology goes so quickly that. Um, that it will probably um, be replaced with something else. But yeah, look, just go to our Douglas County websites and you will see and go to open space and look for, look for our properties and you will see some, some great maps attached to each of the properties also. But the big one would be the interactive map that's on the website um, for DC. Oh yeah, go ahead. DC outdoors, that. make sure you get DC Colorado, not Washington DC. So, um, so it is DC Outdoors. That's the website, DC Outdoors. Dot Just Google it. Just Google okay. DC Google. Outdoors. All right. Yeah, Google it. Uh, that's the best, and that's easiest the way to get one. to. That's the interactive map. Google mm -hmm. DC Outdoors for the. Okay, I'm adding that to the. Chat. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. Another question. Um, about uh, the lifespan of some of the owls in our. The ones that we saw tonight. I think, I think Devin would be able to answer that. He jumped because off there's the call. a, there's a, she's off the call. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. I would say because there's, it really varies. Now, if if you had an owl that's in Devin's circumstance, it might live a really full life because it doesn't have the predators to worry about, doesn't have the cars to worry about, doesn't have the poisons to worry about. And, um, but it, an owl in the, in the wild, um, I, I'm, I'm not gonna give you that number right now because it, it really, really varies. Okay. So yeah, I know birds, birds can live a pretty good lifespan, but it depends on their situation. So speaking of their uh, lifespan, what predators do owls uh, need to be concerned with? Um, there, there are some, some hawks that, that can take them out. And then there are um, also birds that the owls will take out. So some of the, some of the owls do 
um, do go after other birds too. Um, uh, the other, the main, right now, the, the main predator, I, I guess, uh, let's say bobcats. Um, bobcats um, are really good at leaping. Um, they have really sharp claws. They're really good at getting birds. Um, they can climb trees and go where the birds are perching and possibly sleeping. And so I would say the wild cats are probably going to be um, the biggest, um, biggest threat. Um, and also keep in mind your domestic cats. Um, they take out a lot of birds. And I know when I grew up, um, all of our cats went outside. And for the last part of my life, all the, the cats are in the house now. <laughs> and because otherwise they'd be eating the birds and, um, and every other little animal that would come around, so. Jackie, um, yes. Great horned owl eat the other owls that we saw, like the screech owl and the sawgrass. They eat smaller owls. Um, I think they could. You know, some of these are more Devon questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, but Fair but I, you know, there there are some that that probably would eat the smaller ones, and I'm sure that she keeps them um, separate in her situation where she has a lot of different owls together and a lot of raptors and and she's talking about chicken in the back you know the chickens can be right. have to be careful but um yeah yeah that is possible we're um we're a few minutes after eight fifteen, so i'm going to give you the rest of the questions now and let you maybe kind of combine some of them do owls okay. mate for life How some many, of them uh, do uh-huh okay some uh, of them do, do mate for life Yes. Um, how many eggs do they typically lay at a time? How long does a baby stay in the nest? And yep. to address yeah. the silent flight characteristics of owls. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the eggs and the amount of time that they spend in their nest will vary from species to species. Some of them are you know, in the nest just a very short time, whereas the great horned owl, um, you know, you're talking about couple months and some of them um, have the babies in the nest for a sh much shorter time but they'll continue to go ahead and feed feed their babies so it it really it really varies from from owl species to owl species and it depends on what their prey is going to be and um, you know some of our smaller owls don't come back from migration until we have um, we have the insects that um, can survive um, after the big frosts have gone. So um, they don't want to migrate up here without being able to get to the insects. So, you know, each, each owl species is going to have totally different habitats, um, different, there's some that, that um, incubate their eggs at different times so that there are different ages um, of babies that they're feeding. And this, this helps with, um, with survival of, of those, um, those animals that can, if one doesn't make it, then they have another one that's coming up of a different age, so forth. So each, each one is varied. So, you know, do a little, do a little research. If there's one owl you wanna um, pick up specifically, do research, whether it's online or um, one of these um, really good, good books is in, it'll need to be a book that's a little more in depth, not, not just a bird ID book, but one that has some really good information, like, like the Sibley's Bigger, the Bird Life beha and Behavior, or the second edition of the Colorado Breeding, Breeding Bird Atlas. The Breeding Bird Atlas has some wonderful information too. One so, more question, okay. kind of along that same line. Um, are there apps that you recommend for the phone? Okay, um, Merlin and um, also uh, the Audubon. Um, Audubon has one. Um, let me see what it's called. You can ju just go to Aud Audubon app. Um, it's called Audubon Guides. And um, you can go there and you can 
get everything from the description to behaviors to they'll show you videos um, they'll show you the calls like if i go into this one explore owls and um and you can go by the name so I go to the name i get to the barn owl and i'll click on the barn owl and i want to hear the call of the barn owl i'll click on that and i'll push the button so we can hear there he goes he's a real screecher that's a bad sound but that's a barn owl <laughs> okay so um so anyway, it, it um, offers a lot of information on just one one app, and um, I think you'd be. And it doesn't. I can't remember how much it costs to um, get this, but I think it was within the ten dollar range, so not too much. Yeah, I use uh, Merlin, which is through Cornell. Mm -hmm. I think the version that I have is free, so it's a good one. Uh huh. Good. Good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. that's the end of the questions. Anything else you want to close with? Um, for me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, just the main thing is is conservation, and I think we need to look at conservation from things that we can do by keeping our cats inside. So um, our cats aren't eating the rabbits that the the owls want to eat. <laughs> you know, um, we have to think we have to have enough prey species out there. So it's not just we're not just preserving owls, but we have to preserve the habitat. We have to preserve those little animals that they're, they want to eat, those mice. You know, don't put all of your poisons outside. You know, if you have a real mouse problem in your house, put the bait in your house. Don't put it outside, which will feed all of the um, other wildlife that's going to be there anyway. So just, you know, take care of your internal mouse problem. Um, and that'd be a good way to go. So just some good common sense, things that we can do, as well as, you know, support um, open space, support organizations like DLC that holds the conservation easements for um, our open space properties that the county has purchased. Um, they want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So um, it's good to have partners like that. So um, yeah, I think conservation, and read, study up, um, and get just main thing is get out indoors and enjoy it. I think we all have stories in our brains that we've stored away, you know, where we've encountered, you know, different kinds of birds and different um, things that are happening that are enjoyable. And get your families out there, get your friends, go for a walk with a friend, you can social distance and, and get out there and, and still, you know, be safe even during this time and and get out there and observe get some binoculars and um that's that's my favorite tool i think the binoculars besides the loppers so i can so i can cut the bad weeds out <laughs> so <laughs> anyway um anyway it's nice uh, great that you um took some time tonight to do this um we could be watching politics on tv but <laughs> instead we're learning about birds <laughs> that's right that's right. So good. Um, all right. Thank you all for attending, and I hope to see you uh, see you at another uh, event soon. Thanks so much for your support. Okay. Good night. Bye. Stay safe. Have fun. Get outside. <laughs> Get outside. Definitely. <laughs> go play. Go play outside. <laughs> go play outside. Yes. Go make some memories. Thank you, Jess. Yes. Okay. Good night. Thanks for your help. Bye bye.